Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. Good day, everyone. Welcome back to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast for the second last episode of 2017. You're listening to episode number 115. And if you're one of my inner circle piano teaching community members, a very special welcome to you. My name is Tim Topham, your host for the show. And if this is your first time here, thank you very, very much for tuning in. I do hope you enjoy today's episode. And remember that you can, of course, listen back to any of the previous episodes, any of the previous 114 episodes using uh, the iPad, uh, using any of the apps on the phone for podcasts or heading to my website. The Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is a place where you can get weekly inspiration, ideas, business and teaching strategies to help support your teaching and to grow your studio. Today's show notes and full transcript are now available at timtopham.com slash episode 115. We're going to have a slightly shorter episode today. It's just me and I'm going to be talking about a very important topic. It's all about imposter syndrome what it is, what causes it and how to combat it. Because I know from a number of the emails that I've received over the last few years that this is a big issue for many, many piano teachers out there. So I'm going to jump straight in and give you an overview of an email that I received. Uh, I actually received this email, I think it would be at least a year ago, perhaps even a little bit more. And I've been wanting to do this episode, but I've never known quite how to do it. Um, so I've put some more thought into it and today is the day uh, I didn't want to leave it out there any longer without addressing it because I know that the feelings mentioned in the email I'm about to read out to you will be shared by many of you. So here's the email that I received. It said, hi Tim. First, I'd like to compliment you and tell you that discovering your website and more recently your podcast have done much to inspire me in my teaching and have revved up my energy to try new things with my students. Please keep the podcast going because some of my best opportunities to learn are via podcasts during a city commute. She's writing from uh, San Jose, California. I also appreciate the technology component, your focus on energizing kids and giving us some relevant tips on the current hits the younger students like. Also, thankfully, you're a good writer as well, making it a pleasure to read and hear you speak articulately. I do have a suggestion and or question for you. I'm not a classically trained piano teacher. It sort of fell upon me because I had played for years, but truthfully, only with neighborhood teachers, about 10 years of lessons, ages 5 to 15. With full disclosure, someone asked me to teach them and still wanted me after knowing my background, and soon people were asking me to teach their children and friends, etc. I developed a fairly large client base and have been teaching and getting better at it for the last 6 to 7 years, usually about 15 students a week. I do charge less than the going rate and make no false claims, but at this point I am confident in supporting beginning to intermediate students. However, there are times I feel a bit of an imposter, and I want to seek more training and learn more so that I can become even better at teaching. It's not an option for me to return to university to get a full-on bachelor's degree or higher. I have a master's degree in an unrelated, unrelated subject. But I'm eager to do some part-time work or find a curriculum that would enhance or perhaps fill in any gaps I might have so that I have a firm, solid base. I realize so many teachers are classically and professionally trained and of course have degrees in piano pedagogy, etc. But I suspect I'm not the only one who has fallen into teaching based on his or her, her own performance skills combined with an affable personality and good teaching skills, which I do have. I would love to hear your thoughts in an upcoming podcast about some of us who are in this situation and what some of your more advanced teachers could offer as a way to enrich and uh, our knowledge base. At times I'm worried that those of us in my situation will be criticized by the more professionally trained teachers, so I'm asking for your thoughts on this. If you feel it is not something you can support, I understand, but if you are inclined to include some of us that have arrived to teaching this way, I think you'd find there would be a good audience. Thanks again for your contributions. I just downloaded your chord teaching ebook too, and we'll give that a whirl with some of my students, especially the ones more into playing by ear and learning the current hits. So that's the email that sparked this podcast. And I wonder if you feel the same. 
or no other teachers who are in this um, boat. I can certainly say to the person that wrote this email, you're certainly not alone. And in actual fact, I think if I was to stand in front of an audience of 500 or 1,000 piano teachers and asked all the ones who had professional music training to stand up, what do you think the, uh, the percentage would be? I think it would be half or less that would stand up with a professional degree of some sort in music education. The reality is that anyone can become a piano teacher, of course. There are no barriers to entry and there's no registration requirements or prerequisites. So anyone can do it. And in some ways that's good, in some ways that's bad. It's good because it allows people who are great teachers but haven't had that training to inspire and enthuse uh, the next generation of musicians and that's a great thing. But of course it can be bad too because it means that people without training can sometimes perhaps teach poorly uh, or can do um, some damage I guess to students in poor transfer of technique perhaps or just not being a very good teacher. But you know what? When I think about it and think about some of the best teachers that I had uh, when I was growing up at school and in music, quite often the most accomplished uh, scholars in their fields and the ones with most training were not necessarily the best teachers. In fact, I'd almost say that it was more likely that the ones with PhDs and uh, um, you know amazing skills as researchers and writers in their fields were not often the best teachers. It was the more down-to-earth, normal in inverted commas, uh, people who make the best teachers. So uh, in that regard, I'm totally with the person that wrote this email. I understand and I know that, one, you're not alone, and two, you guys without training, if you're listening to this, make some of the best teachers out there. Uh, And I can only applaud what you're doing. So we'll come back into a little bit more depth about some thoughts on this. Uh, But before we go too deep, I did want to just mention what imposter syndrome actually is. And so I jumped on my favorite site, Wikipedia, and it said that imposter syndrome, also known as imposter phenomenon or fraud syndrome, uh, is a concept describing individuals who are marked by an inability to internalize their accomplishments and a persistent fear of being exposed as a fraud. I thought it's like, uh, I don't know if you've ever had a nightmare or, you know, a bad dream of some sort. You might not wake screaming, but it makes you uncomfortable when you're, uh, you know, you're in a, in a pilot seat in an aircraft, fully dressed as a pilot. You've got the cap on, the, uh, the epaulets with your with your rank on the on your shoulders and uh, you you know that you don't know what to do. Uh, I, I, I can't think of an exact once uh, an exact uh, idea of when this happened to me, but I can think of that feeling in dreams in particular. I've just been completely out of my depth somewhere or uh, actually I do have one because I do public speaking. Um, one of the bad dreams that I have uh, is – that I haven't had any time to prepare and I'm thrown onto stage and I have to make it up. Uh, and uh, that, I, 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 you know, I, in some ways I'd find that a little bit of a fun challenge, but um, in reality it's, it's a bit scary. So, uh, you know, those kind of ideas of feeling like a fraud, being exposed as a fraud, that's what this imposter syndrome is all about. And uh, I did some research. I was looking at a TEDx video. It said the surprising solution to imposter syndrome. Uh, That was the the title of the uh, video. She quoted a figure that 70% of Americans experience some feelings of imposter syndrome. And she broke the imposter syndrome feelings down to four things. Anxiety, self-doubt, perfectionism, and fear of failure. Now, if those four character, if those four things characterize imposter syndrome, then I wouldn't be surprised if it really should be 100% of not just Americans, but most of the world. I mean, we all feel 
a sense of self-doubt sometimes. Sometimes we feel anxiety. Um, many musicians are perfectionists and that can be crippling and debilitating sometimes if, it, if it's to the extreme. Uh, and a fear of failure. Uh, we certainly all have some of those experiences. There are some great videos out there. So if you are feeling like this, uh, feel free to watch those. Just do a, a YouTube search for imposter syndrome. There's one I watched. It was a cartoon one. It was about six minutes long uh, and it was, it was quite a good overview of some thoughts on it too. I should as well, uh, with full disclosure, mention that I had imposter syndrome feelings when I first started teaching. Many of you will know my story. Uh, to make it very, very quick, I studied music at university and then went over to England to teach and I taught a number of different subjects, including information technology and music. Uh, and then, And that was without a teaching degree, mind you back in the days when private schools could hire teachers who weren't trained <laughs> to, to do it. I didn't mind that. I was young and uh, full of confidence and, and so that was not a problem for me. Uh, but I came back to, to Melbourne and I ended up spending the next 10 years or thereabouts in, a, in education, in classrooms and in outdoor education and as in leadership roles, head of department, head of campus and those kind of things, but none of it in piano teaching. The piano teaching really only came about in around 2008 or nine, and then really strongly in 2010 when I actually started blogging for the first time. And I remember I, I was working with my childhood piano teacher, uh, Rosemary, who was a superstar at helping me get uh, on board and, and learn everything that I needed to because I hadn't had any piano teaching training. I was just like many of you guys. Yes, I had a degree in education, so I knew I could teach, but I had never taught piano students formally. And uh, when I first got uh, took on an exam student here in Australia, uh, I freaked out and I realized I really didn't know what I was doing. And that was when I went and sought out a mentor who happened to be my childhood piano teacher who taught me an amazing amount and gave me the confidence that I had to know what I was doing was right and to move forward with it without feeling uh, like I should be worried about anything. So I, I guess I was in a slightly different case to the person who emailed uh, in that I already had a, an education degree, um, but I didn't have the piano teaching experience and I certainly didn't have a pedagogy degree. And I felt that that feeling when I was at conferences or workshops and talking about what I was doing, uh, I felt very insecure about my abilities and I uh, struggled to, to know for sure that uh, the ways I was teaching were the right ways. And so one of the things that I did to help me with my own sense of insecurity with regard to that kind of imposter feeling was to go and find training and to watch masterclasses and to go to workshops and to watch other teachers teach and do everything I could to help learn and grow as a piano teacher. And so I'm going to get to some, um, some suggestions in, in a moment um, about what I think teachers who, feeling, who are feeling this way can do. Um, but let's just cover some other causes. Uh, I've mentioned the first cause, which is not feeling confident personally or professionally. That's how I felt because I was kind of new to it uh, and I, I just I didn't have that self-confidence that, hey, I'm doing, I've been doing this for 10 years. I know what I'm doing. It works. So uh, I'm confident. I, I never had that because I was just starting. And so if you're a new teacher as well, even if you have been trained, you're going to have that sense of, am I doing it right? And you're going to question that all the time for the first few years until you've taught for a little while and then you start to go, oh, you know what, I think I'm, I'm doing okay here and I'm learning from other people online or on courses or workshops and they seem to be doing the same thing as I'm doing, so I think I'm okay. So that's one cause, just a, a, an unconfident professional or personal approach. Another cause of this imposter syndrome is an unhelpful or unrealistic view of other people's 
success and teaching. And this is a really easy one. We've got to remember too, of course, that we know ourselves deeply from the inside, but we only ever see other people from the outside. As one smart person said, I saw this on a comment on one of the uh, imposter syndrome videos. Uh, He or she said, we see our blooper reel and others highlights reel and that's all we see. And social media, of course, makes this 100% worse, doesn't it? You know, all we see is everyone's success. No one puts up posts, well, very rarely puts up posts about how bad everything is going, how insecure they feel, how um, much of an imposter they feel, that they're a fraud. I mean, people don't share those things, generally speaking. And so all we see is other people's highlights reel. So having uh, this view of other people's success can really impact our own feelings too. So I want you to um, consider whether the views you have of other people's success in teaching uh, is is valid and is warranted. And I'd say that we probably put people on a pedestal more than we should. And, uh, you know, some of you who listen to me and what I'm doing and see my my teaching videos and things might go, wow, Tim seems to know what he's doing and I'm not that good yet. uh, So therefore, um, you know, I don't feel so good about my own teaching. Well, you know, stop thinking that right now because I have students who come into lessons and haven't done any practice. I have to get grumpy with uh, parents for not encouraging practice in their students. Uh, I have students who uh, I've got so grumpy with in the past that uh, they've got quite upset. Um, I've lost my temper in the past. You know, I, I'm a flawed teacher as much as anyone else out there. Uh, and so that's the reality. You know, we all have good lessons. We all have bad lessons. We all have um, great successes. Sometimes we have failures. Sometimes we let students go. Sometimes they leave us because of various reasons. And that happens to everybody. So, uh, you know, avoid that, um, that sense of other people all being successful. Uh, everyone has these troubles. And so if that's part of the sense of um, being an imposter that you have because you're just not like everyone else seems to be, then, you know, I would say forget it if you possibly can. Uh, As I mentioned before too, the causes of imposter syndrome are not just about being untrained because my experience is that even people with high-level training can feel like imposters. And I know adults in very high levels in companies uh, that can feel like complete imposters. How on earth did I get to this position? Uh, You know, I'm I'm not that good. I haven't been trained that well. Uh, How did I get here? And, you know, that's a really common human um, think, way of thinking. So uh, this is all very, very natural, very, very normal. Uh, and I'm hoping that you're getting a sense of that now. When it comes to training, you know, there, there, are, there are problems with that as well. Uh, so it's not an easy solution. So it, it, let, let's say that you're feeling like the person who emailed at the beginning. Uh, I could say as a recommendation, go and get some training, whatever that is. Well, that's not the easiest solution because, well, one, training costs money. It takes time. In Australia, training in pedagogy is very hard to access. There aren't that many courses. Uh, of course, training is still tends to be based on a classical tradition uh, in, in most cases. And it still doesn't give people who are undergoing that training many business and income-related re- uh, skills, although that is getting better. There are some more business-savvy pedagogy courses out there, which is good. And many great teachers out there aren't the ones who have this training anyway. So it's definitely not a silver bullet uh, or a uh, sort of a, a, a solve every problem, but there's no doubt that it helps. And so one thing that I'll be talking about uh, as I come to the end of this um, shortly is some suggestions about where you could go for some more training and support. The Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly supported by The Inner Circle, the world's leading professional development and training community for piano teachers. Inner Circle members get access to an extensive library of courses, 
teaching videos, lesson plans and downloads that cover everything you need to know, not only to teach piano creatively and inspire students of all ages and abilities, but also to support you in building and growing your own studio. On top of that, you get access to our monthly online masterminds, exclusive member discounts on products, services, software, and sheet music, plus our active community forums, where you not only get advice and input from me, but also from hundreds of fellow piano teachers and my handpicked team of experts from around the world. If you're serious about expanding your teaching repertoire, learning the best strategies to motivate and inspire students while growing a thriving studio, the inner circle is the place to be. Find out more at timtopham.com slash community and use the code PIANOPODCAST to take $100 off an annual subscription locked in for the life of your membership. Now, I did want to uh, read out another um, conversation that I had online with someone. Uh, his, his name is Frederick. He's from Poland and this is a conversation that we had on Facebook and Frederick gave me permission to um, release this story and I think this will resonate with teachers as well. And what this is is a, an example of where classical training actually uh, goes wrong and doesn't help someone. So I'm going to be reading a story of someone who has an immense level of uh, skill and training and who still feels like they um, aren't respected and don't know quite what they're doing. And so this is why I have uh, you know questions and doubts about the formalities of training too. So here it is anyway. Uh, Frederick says, Hi, Tim. I've been listening to your podcast and following you for a while. It's been so inspiring and helpful in many ways as I feel I really want to become a full-time music educator in the future. I wanted to share with you my backstory. Uh, I'm a student from a small country in Europe. I finished classical piano performance degree in Academy of Music studying under very successful pianist. Uh, Sorry, I'll try my best to uh, fix the English uh, as I go. Uh, At the beginning, I think I was at the top of my pianistic level. I knew for 200% that I'm linking my future with music performance. However, during my first year, I started feeling disillusioned about the music community. I started majoring in sound engineering. Month after month, year after year, I stopped enjoying classical music, community and education and didn't feel any drop of creativity. After finishing my BA degree in piano performance, I decided I didn't want to play, which was a huge bummer for my family. I continued my master's degree doing sound engineering. And that's a very similar to what I did, funnily enough. I did a Bachelor of Music in sound engineering too. I feel confused about my path now because right now I am living in the US studying again, but I switched to contemporary music focusing on pop and jazz. I've spent over half my life practicing on piano, doing classical stuff, and I think because of my fear of the highly judgmental community, I backed off and also didn't feel classical education has given me anything beyond just reading and memorizing pieces from sheets. I also got a feeling that popular jazz music, that community, was also unfriendly, and that's why I felt I needed to get away for some time. I'm practicing a hell of a lot now and feel like I'm getting at the sorry, feel like I'm at the very beginning, which is weird considering my history of having completed a degree, participated in international competitions and having major success in a few. Looking back, I hated uh, my time doing sound engineering, but I know I developed a lot of new skills and gained useful knowledge. I got jobs thanks to that, which I could afford to come to the which allowed me to come to the US and I'm still profiting from that. But now I know for sure that I need to link my future with piano performance and education as it feels like it's my water to keep going on. I know it's a matter of my sensitive personality, but in many ways I despise classical judgmental environment and education I was around back in my country, mainly because it's based on nothing but reading music. Of course, later you learn how to interpret music and so on, but considering the amount of time and effort To learn a piece, I feel it's not worth it and students are missing vital skills at the core of music. Right now, focusing on jazz and contemporary styles, I feel like finally I am learning real, in inverted commas, music. How to listen to it and how to feel it and I'm just at the beginning of the journey, although I've spent over half my life developing my musical skills in the classical field. 
I was wondering, have you ever experienced something like that throughout your career among your students? I hope you would find some time to read this and you don't have to respond to me, but maybe it could be a topic for a future episode. My response, hey, Frederick, thanks for your story. It's sadly very common and the whole reason I'm so passionate about changing the face of piano pedagogy. To only now feel like you really are getting to understand music is a terrible travesty of education and I hope that my supporting, by supporting teachers in my community, I can help avoid that for some students coming through the system now. And then I mentioned that I'd like to record, um, mention this on a future podcast uh, and he said, yes, absolutely no problem with that. Of course, I'd be honoured if you read my story out loud. So hello, Frederick, I'm sure we'll be listening to this. And so that was uh, a really interesting discussion um, in regard to, to the, the kinds of training that many of us have had in the classical field uh, and how helpful or not it is as a teacher. So this is someone uh, with an amazing high-level music education training who feels that that training actually hasn't helped and has really gone back to the drawing board and started again and is only now starting to feel like they're coming to grips with things. And so I have a feeling this would also resonate with many teachers who are listening. So thank you, Frederick, for sharing that. Uh, There's a little bit more to the story, but uh, I don't want to take too long on this episode. Um, uh, So let's, I'm going to start wrapping things up by talking about some solutions here, some, some, suggestions I guess um, and of course I'm, I'm no psychologist I'm just going on my own experience when I give these suggestions but stories like this the first email and the second um, I do get a lot of times and particularly stories like Frederick's where non-trained musicians who come from a background of perhaps being accompanists or playing in church or playing in rock bands and then go into teaching because someone sees their passion and knows that they'd probably be quite good with kids and they fall into, in inverted commas, teaching. And it's really, really common and it's okay. It's totally fine for this to happen. What I would say is that if you're in that category and you may or may not feel like an imposter, probably depends on how long you've been teaching, What I would recommend you do is try and connect with teachers as much as you can. Try and find a mentor in particular. That was my biggest solution for feelings of inadequacy and uh, knowing that I didn't know what I was doing was getting a mentor and surrounding yourself with people who can support you and also absorbing as much training as possible. It's so, so crucial. So here are my... uh, a few little solutions or suggestions for you if you're feeling like an imposter piano teacher. Firstly, try and avoid comparing yourself to other teachers, particularly ones that you see online. Judge yourself on your students and the feedback you get from parents. Are your students having success? Are they smiling when they're leaving leaving the lessons with you? Do they want to come back and see you each week? What do parents say their kids say about you. These are the kinds of things to judge yourself on. If you've got the confidence to, sharing videos of your students playing, um, even asking questions about a video, uh, as people tend to do in some Facebook groups, can be a great way to get feedback and confirmation about what you're doing or just get help on it. Of course, we never used to be able to do this, even 10 15 years ago, quickly upload a video of a student playing with, with a problem. And, uh, and so that's a great thing to be able to do now. Um, suggestion number two, if you're on social media, try not to compare yourself to others all the time. Remember that you're seeing from inside your head your own blooper reel all the time and you're only seeing the highlight reel of other people. I didn't make that up, by the way. I got that from online somewhere, but I thought it was a great analogy. Remember that everyone has blooper reels. You just can't see them. Uh, Realize, of course, that we all have these feelings. Anyone who has this sense of being an imposter or not 100% confident about their teaching or the outcomes they're getting for students, it's totally natural. And you're not alone. We all have these feelings. 
And then I would say, get some, get, get training as much as you can. Now, the great, there are so many opportunities available to you now for training online that's either free or very inexpensive. Uh, and of course, I can't go past the opportunity to speak about my own inner circle. Um, because one of the great things about being a member of a community like my inner circle is that you're surrounded by other teachers and experts and there are many people in there who have mentored other teachers and so I can actually connect you up with a potential mentor if you're feeling like that would be a helpful thing for you. Of course, as a member, you also get access to all my training. So if you're unsure or you you know that you're a little bit weaker in playing with chords or teaching lead sheets or teaching beginners without method books, then there's training there for you. And there's me and all the other teachers there to help you if you've got questions about that training. It's the reason why I'm not selling courses as individual packages uh, at the moment because I can help teachers much more by being a part of the community than I could if you just did a training course and I sold it to you and off you went with it. So that's one of the reasons I know people ask, you know, why can't I just buy, I just want your notebook beginners, that's all I want. Well, you know, I, I want to be a better mentor to you and a better support to you and the best way for me to do that is through the community because it's not just me, there's a whole lot of other people. There's hundreds of teachers in there uh, and the experts that I've brought in too. So get training, watch others teach through masterclasses. I was reminded uh, when I did my book launch for the AMEB here in Melbourne a couple of weeks ago, um, one of the people who ran a training course, it would have been in I don't know, five years, six, seven, maybe even longer ago that I actually, he reminded me that when I was first starting as a teacher, I drove to a place called Mildura from Melbourne. That's about a seven-hour drive to, in order to see a great teacher in action and to watch them teaching masterclasses on the music that I was teaching. And, you know, that was the kind of commitment that I had to this. So I drove up there the night before. I had a hotel room. Uh, I think I stayed the the following night as well because I didn't want to drive home afterwards. So it was a big investment in time and money. But that was the kind of length that I went to to ensure that I knew that I was teaching the right way. And uh, I am so thankful that I went to so many masterclasses. I literally, uh, every masterclass that ever happened in the first year or two of me teaching, I I went to. And my mentor, uh, Rosemary, told me to do this. She said, just go and see other people teach. You're going to learn so much. Even if you're watching a Chopin scherzo being taught, you'll still learn even if you're not teaching at that level yet. So watch masterclasses. If you can't get to them or you're in a place where there aren't many that are held, then watch them online. I was just watching Valentina Lasitza uh, teaching someone, I think it was a Beethoven um, sonata the other day. Like, And there's, you know, every, almost every great name current concert artist or recent has masterclasses on YouTube. So go and watch them. Uh, do online courses. I've mentioned my own online courses, of course, in the Inner Circle, but I'm not the only one producing great content for piano teachers. Uh, Do remember, though, of course, that it's very easy to download a whole lot of courses and then never use any of them. So have a bit of a goal in mind before you start um, willy-nilly going and downloading everyone's resources. Uh, It's really easy to get overwhelmed by there being too much out there. Uh, And read. Read a lot. Um, I have lots of my favorite books listed on my website. If you head to my, I think it's my tools menu, um, you can just just search for Tim Topham resources. You'll be able to find, actually, we'll put a link in the show notes to my resources page. It lists the kinds of things I use to run my studio and business. So my cameras and iPad tools and holders and all that kind of stuff. But uh, towards the bottom is my book or are my book recommendations. And I really recommend you get reading. Uh, The Savvy Music Teacher by David Cutler is still one of the top of my list. Philip Johnston's The Practice Revolution is fantastic. Um, And the Simultaneous Learning um, books, 
the author's name of which has just completely skipped my mind. Um, he, I've, uh, Paul Harris, of course, sorry. Uh, Paul, any of Paul Harris's books, they're phenomenal and they're small and they're short as well. Even better, right? Connect with other teachers uh, as much as you can. And if you're interested, then my inner circle is a great place to do that. And as I said, finding a mentor can be a great solution for this whole sense of feeling like an imposter. So there you go. I do hope that has been helpful and perhaps um, put your mind at ease if you're feeling like this. Uh, As I say, if you're getting great results, your students are enjoying their music, parents are happy, then it sounds like you're probably doing something really, really valuable for the community and the world at large. So keep it up. If you have any doubts about certain aspects of your teaching, so maybe you're just not sure about how you're teaching beginners or the way in which you teach a an aspect of technique or something like that, then go out there and find find some answers. But do keep in mind that we all seem to teach some of these things, particularly when it comes to technique, very differently. Some of the videos I see online, everyone going, wow, isn't that amazing and talking about in great ways. I actually don't think is actually very good. So that's, you know, remember that there's always differing differing opinions on things, but go out there, research, learn, absorb as much as you can. And I know you will do great things in the future and have a great impact on many, many students. All right. I hope that has been helpful for you. Quick reminder that the Piano Pivot is on next week. Now, this is my five-day free global piano teaching challenge to help plan your studio for 2018. Now, if you haven't already found out about this or you haven't got your registration in, then it's a very simple process. Just head to pianopivot.com and uh, you'll be able to sign up there. You can also read about what's actually happening uh, and the different focus that we'll be having on each of the five days. We'll be launching with a pre-launch on Sunday, this coming Sunday, Um, In fact, it'll be Saturday if you're in London or the United States or Europe. Uh, So do check out the times and dates uh, and make sure you pop your registration through so you can grab the free full color PDF playbook download, which is going to be our planning book um, and all the great stuff is in there. So um, stay tuned for more information on that. Uh, You'll get it by email as long as you're registered. And finally... It's very, very close to release time for my free Apple and Android apps. If you've been wanting an easy way to access all my resources, my podcasts, my articles, all that great stuff, then stay tuned. I think by the time I next speak to you, that will be live and I'll be able to share that with you. So stay tuned for that. We're working out the final kinks uh, and it's going to be released very, very soon. Now, no, there won't be an episode of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast next week because I will be supporting everyone on their piano pivot. So the last episode of the year will be on the 15th of December. That's going to be our 2000 or 2017 wrap up. And uh, we're going to be talking then about the plan for the podcast next year. Hopefully, I'll be able to um, explore the app with you and mention that. And uh, if we have time, I was also thinking that could be a good opportunity to let you in on a little bit of behind the scenes at timtopham.com, some of my own goals and uh, introducing some members of my team, uh, which uh, who enable me to do all these um, things like piano pivots and podcasts and blog posts and all that great stuff. So giving you a little bit of an insight into that, uh, perhaps in two weeks time, I still haven't uh, done the final planning for that episode. So stay tuned. I look forward to uh, to catching up with you then. And I really look forward to hanging out with you on the Piano Pivot. Again, head to pianopivot.com if you're interested in checking out that challenge that we're running. I'm Tim Topham. Thank you so much for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast and I will speak to you again really, really soon. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.